Your program notes indicate that Howard Gardner is going to provide sup supplemental commentary, and I'm sure he is. But in addition to that, he's going to introduce our next two speakers. But I get to introduce Howard. <laughs> Howard Gardner is one of the most widely respected and influential educators of our time. At Harvard, he's the Hobbes Professor of Cognition and Education in the Graduate School of Education and also Adjunct Professor of Psychology. Dr. Gardner earned his PhD from Harvard. His 31 honorary degrees are from colleges and universities around the world. Howard Gardner is best known in, the ed in educational circles for his theory of multiple intelligences, a critique of the notion that there exists a single human intelligence that can be assessed by standard psychometric instruments. For the past two decades, he's directed the Good Project, a group of initiatives that promote excellence, engagement, and ethics in education and seek to prepare, seeks to prepare students to become good workers and good citizens. Through research-based concepts, this project seeks to help students reflect on the ethical dilemmas that arise in everyday life. Gardner's newest research undertaking is a large-scale national study documenting how different groups think about the goals of college and the value of emphasizing both liberal arts and the sciences. This study seeks to understand how incoming students, graduating students, faculty, administrators, alumni, and job recruiters all importantly impact the college experience. One of the most recent of Dr. Gardner's 30 books is titled The App Generation, How Today's Youth Navigate Identity, Intimacy, and Imagination in the Digital World. Dr. Gardner is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a lot of other societies. <laughs> uh, and was elected a member of the American Philosophical Society in 2006, where he currently serves on the council. And he's going to introduce our next speakers. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Clyde, for that kind introduction and for your exemplary service as president of the American Philosophical Society. <clears throat> In 1965, there appeared an issue of Daedalus, the publication of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. For our guests from uh, Britain, I should explain that the American Philosophical Society was founded in 1743 by Benjamin Franklin, who was blocked by a mid-20th century technology. <laughs> <laughs> um, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is ably represented today here by Jonathan Fanton, its president, is a Johnny-come-lately organization it was founded in the soon-to-be post-colonial era in 1780. <laughs> the issue of Daedalus, to which I was referring, was called the professions. And in the introduction to that issue, guest ed editor Kenneth Lynn wrote the following in 1965. Everywhere in American life, the professions are triumphant. America has become more cognizant of the professions and more dependent upon their services than at any previous time in their history. Thorsten Velbin's 60-year-old dream of a professionally run society has never been closer to realization. And Lynn then added, because there's simply not enough professionals to go around, the practitioner of today is perforce burdened with too much work, thereby jeopardizing existing professional standards even further. Many of us here today will resonate to what Lynn wrote over half a century ago. And if you were like me, until a few years ago, you would have thought in your innocence that professions are still triumphant, still aspirational, still overloaded. But much has changed in the landscape of the professions since 1965. Some changes are for the good. Professions are far more open to women, racial and ethnic minorities, and other once marginalized groups. Professions are also more open in terms of their practices, less mysterious, less often seen 
as in Bernard Shaw's famous quip, as, quote, conspiracies against the laity, unquote. There may also be less positive trends, a blurring of what counts as a profession, the greater availability of fly-by-night accreditation, a general skepticism about the importance and legitimacy of expertise. But if you're like me, you would have not been prepared for the critique put forth by this afternoon's speakers, a remarkable father and son team. Richard Susskind is a distinguished member of the legal profession, acclaimed author, teacher, and advisor to many policy units, and a true pioneer in studying the effects of computers and artificial intelligence on the law. His son, Daniel Susskind, holds two degrees from Oxford, where he is now a fellow of Balliol College. He has worked in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit at 10 Downing Street and was a Kennedy Scholar at Harvard. Now, there are more details about the Susskinds in the program, but not the fact that in two weeks, Daniel is getting married. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and speaking of uh, family, I hope you can see uh, Richard and Daniel. I don't hold it against them that they look long enough to, young enough to be my own son and grandson, respectively. <laughs> in a path-breaking book, The Future of the Professions, how technology will transform the work of human experts, the Suskins question whether the professions will continue to exist in recognizable form and even raise the heretical possibility that their demise might be a benevolent outcome. <laughs> in candor, when I first read their book uh, a year or so ago, I found it deeply disturbing and wrote critically of it. And that critical uh, point and my correspondence with them where they commented on it is actually in the in the public domain which led me to a decision not to take the valuable time here to repeat that criticism um, in fact to turn the questions over to you after they finish speaking but I have saved for them a final question for each which I think uh, they will take in a good humored spirit uh, <laughs> So as I said, when I first read their book, I was deeply disturbing and wrote critically of it. But I've since come to appreciate its importance and perhaps even its farsightedness and its wisdom. And so I'm absolutely delighted that Richard and Daniel Susskind accepted our, conversa our conversation, accepted our invitation to cross the bond, to cross the pond and to speak to us today. Please join in welcoming them. Thank you very much for that warm introduction and for the invitation to be here with you today. It really is a great uh, honor to be talking with you today. What, what we want to do in the next 40 minutes or so is talk you through some of the key ideas in our work. And in particular, we want to do six things with you. Uh, the first is I want to introduce to you the context uh, for the work that we undertook. I then want to share some examples of some of the things that are taking place in the professions and what we're trying to make sense of in our work. I'm then going to hand over uh, to my dad, who's going to talk a little bit about technology. A lot of the ideas in our work are underpinned by technology. And one technology in particular, which is artificial intelligence, and we have a particular way of thinking about what's happening in artificial intelligence and how it affects the professions, and, and he'll share that with you and then we'll come back to me and I'll say a little bit about what this means for the work that the professions do and finally I want to just close with two of many implications that I think this has for for the professions. So first the the context I suppose the most common question we get asked is how we came to write the book together and what can I say about a co-author who in many ways has become like a father to me. Um, <laughs> Now, as you, as, you, as you heard in the introduction, my, my dad has spent his career really trying to understand how technology affects the legal profession, trying to answer the question of whether or not we can build systems that can perform legal reasoning. And what he found, particularly in the last five, 10 years, is that in talking to audiences of lawyers, uh, at the end, a stray doctor or a stray teacher or a stray accountant would approach him and say, what you're talking about in the legal profession, that's all very interesting. But actually, those trends and patterns are taking place in our profession, too. 
And we first spoke about this back in 2010, and I was working in government at the time. I was in the policy unit in Downing Street, working on tax policy, on health policy, on education policy, but with a good overview of lots of different professions. And it was clear then that significant change was in the air and that the professions from a distance appeared to face a common set of challenges. So we had this idea of joining forces to investigate the professions more generally, and that's what we did. And uh, it began our research project looking at the future of the profession. So in our work, we look at eight professions. The ideas are no, by no means contained to those, but we look not only at law, but also at medicine, at, at education, at journalism, consulting, tax and audit, architecture. We even look at the clergy. Uh, the book is in part uh, based on a set of interviews that we did, both with traditional professionals, but also a wide group of people and institutions outside the professions who are using technology to solve the sorts of problems that traditionally only a very particular type of professional has solved. And it's a book of, in part, it's a book of history. It's a book of the history of the professions. It's a book of the sociology of the professions. In part, it's a book about the economics of information and, and expertise. But the, the very, the very, broad idea is this, that we see two broad trends taking place across the professions, both underpinned by technology. And the first trend, I think, is a reassuringly familiar one. It's simply a more efficient version of, of what we have today. And here, professionals of different stripes use technology, but essentially just to streamline and optimize the traditional ways in which they've worked. And in the professions, in some cases, this is for hundreds of years. We might say here that technology complements professionals in their work. It makes their work more valuable and more important. And as you look across the professions, there's lots of examples of this. It's things like doctors talking to patients via Skype. It's architects using computer-assisted design software to design bigger, more complicated buildings. It's teachers using online material in the classrooms. But there's then a second trend, and this is a very different proposition, and here technology doesn't just streamline and optimize the traditional way in which these professions have worked, but it actively displaces traditional professionals from their work, uh, rather than complementing professionals, making their work more valuable and important, instead it substitutes for professionals uh, and takes those tasks away from them. Sometimes, uh, and, and you'll hear a little bit later on, we call these increasingly capable systems and machines. Sometimes these systems and machines uh, take on this work alone and operate alone, but other times, and this is quite important, they're just designed and operated by people that look quite unlike traditional professionals. And the argument that we develop in the book is that for now, and in the medium term, we'll see these two trends developing in parallel. We'll see examples of both, but in the long run, we think that that second trend will dominate. That through technology, we'll find new and better ways of solving the sorts of problems that traditionally only a very particular type of professional has solved, and we think this is a challenge to the traditional professions, to the professions as we currently conceive of them today. So that really is where the thinking and the evidence led us, but it also led us to ask a, form, a far more fundamental question, and this is what we open our, our work with, which is why do we have these professions at all? And the answer to that question is that the professions, although from a distance they look quite different, actually in analogous ways, they're all a, a solution to the same problem. And the problem is this, which is that nobody knows everything. Human beings have uh, what Herbert Hart, the legal philosopher, said, limited understanding of the world around them. And so we turn to professionals because they have the expertise that we need to, uh, to make progress in life. They have the expertise that we need to solve the daily challenges uh, that many of us face and, and we can't solve by ourselves. So in what we call a print-based industrial society, the professions are the way that we solve these daily challenges. I said they have the knowledge, the experience, the wisdom, the know-how, and our, our term for this is they have the practical expertise. They've got this practical ability to solve these difficult problems that those they help do not. They operate under a grand bargain, and it's an arrangement that differs across jurisdictions and differs across professions, but ultimately it's an arrangement that entitles the professions, often to the exclusion of others, to provide certain types of services, and they're entrusted to act as gatekeepers, each profession responsible for its own unique body of knowledge. So doctors look after medical knowledge, lawyers look after legal knowledge, accountants look after accounting knowledge, and so on. And so this is our analysis of the professions in this print-based industrial society, but we're no longer in a print-based industrial society. We're in what we call a technology-based internet society, and those traditional professions are creaking. They're unaffordable. Most people, most institutions, simply do not have access to 
the expertise of first-rate professionals, or indeed in many cases, any professionals. They're antiquated. By and large, the professions, when you look at them, rely upon pretty old-fashioned ways of producing and sharing knowledge and information, despite in many cases the existence of feasible alternatives. They're opaque. Sometimes this is because the work that the professions do is genuinely too complicated for ordinary people to understand, but other times, and take a walk through a British courtroom and have a look at the oak panelling and the wigs, you get the sense there's some intentional obfuscation at work there too. <laughs> and finally, the professions underperform, and we mean something very particular by this, and it's this, which is that given the way we organise expertise in society, in, in the heads of professionals, in the heads of human beings, the finest practical expertise, the finest ability to solve these difficult problems, it's a very scarce resource. Only a, a very privileged and lucky few have access to it. So we ask the question, as we move from this print-based industrial society to an internet society, might there be, through technology, other ways of solving the sorts of problems to which traditionally only the professions alone have solved them? Are there other ways, as an economist would put it, to produce and share practical expertise? Do we still need those traditional gatekeepers? Now, many of us are comfortable with the idea of technology affecting blue-collar work. Think of agriculture in the US in 1900. 41% of the US workforce worked in agriculture. Today, or in, in, in 2000, it's something like 2%, and, and today it's, it's something like uh, uh, it's something similar to that. Technology has driven a shrinking of the US working population that's in agriculture. The story is the same in manufacturing. Huge increase in real output in US manufacturing, but a decline in overall employment. Uh, in fact, over the first decade of the 21st century, about 5.6 million jobs were lost in US manufacturing. You'll hear accounts that it's about trade, it's about China, but it's not about China. It's a story about technology. It's that through technology, we can far more productively produce the sorts of things that might have required large numbers of people in the past. We're comfortable with this story in the world of blue-collar work because we tend to think of the work that blue-collar workers do as routine. And I don't mean here routine in the common sense sense, in the sense that the work is perhaps repetitive, mundane, or dull, but I mean it in an economic sense, which is that human beings find it very easy to articulate how it is that they perform routine work. So we find it very easy to write rules for machines to follow to perform those tasks in their place. Instead, we think of professional work as being non-routine, uh, as the sorts of things that human beings find it very difficult to explain how they do, things like creativity, judgment, empathy. Uh, and so we tend to think that professional work is somehow immune from technological change. And, and what we do in the book is we, there are hundreds of case studies of the sort of thing that we're trying to make sense of. What, what, I, what I want to do now is just to give you a, a, a taste, a flavor of the sort of thing we're talking about. So in education, more people signed up for Harvard's online courses in a single year than attended the actual university in its entire existence up until that point. In medicine, uh, Google DeepMind, it's a system it's the artificial intelligence team at Google. It's a system that came out of uh, a team of researchers actually at UCL uh, in, in London uh, who built a system called AlphaGo. And it was a system that was designed to play the game Go, incredibly complicated game. Um, most people in artificial intelligence thought we were about a decade away from building a system that could outperform one of the leading human Go experts at Go. Uh, Google saw really interesting progress was being made at UCL in this AlphaGo team. They bought it. They gave them access to the huge amounts of processing power and data storage capability that they have. Uh, and in March um, of last year, AlphaGo sat down with Lee Sedol, who at the time was probably the world's best Go champion, and beat him four games to one. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that Google didn't acquire this because they wanted to have a capability at board games. Uh, and, and they've teamed up, one of the things they've done is team up with Moorfields Eye Hospital uh, in the UK to use this system, not to play Go, but help to diagnose and treat various types of eye problems. In, in the world of journalism, Associated Press in 2014 started to use algorithms to computerize the production of their earnings reports. So using these algorithms, they produce about 15 times as many earnings reports as when they relied upon traditional print journalists alone. In the legal world, on eBay every year, 60 million disputes arise, 60 million, and they're resolved online without any traditional lawyers using what's called an e-mediation platform. So just bear in mind, 60 million disputes, that is 40 times the number of civil claims that are filed in the entire English and Welsh justice system. It's three times the number of lawsuits filed in the entire US justice system. They're resolved on this one website without any traditional lawyers. 
eight million, uh, 52 million of the 60 million without any human mediation at all. JP Morgan uh, earlier this year announced uh, the development of a system called COIN, contract intelligence. It scans commercial loan agreements. It does in a few seconds what might have taken, it's estimated about 32,000 hours of traditional human lawyer time. Best known legal brand in the United States said isn't a traditional law firm anymore. It's LegalZoom.com, an online document drafting and legal advice platform in the world of tax, TurboTax. Uh, 2014, 48 million Americans used online tax preparation software of this sort rather than a traditional tax accountant to help them. In the world of audit, the traditional way in which we do an audit, far too many financial transactions to review them all. We take a small sample, we hope, and we have methods for trying to ensure that that sample is representative, and we extrapolate about the broader population of financial transactions that we, we can't view. What you see now being developed in some of the big four are systems that don't take a small sample and extrapolate, but instead use the entire population of data, uh, reviewing all financial transactions, very different types of system. What's, uh, IBM have a supercomputer called Watson, and some of you in the room will have heard of it. It's the supercomputer that went on the quiz show Jeopardy a few years ago and beat the two best living human Jeopardy champions at Jeopardy. Uh, they're now using this system, again, in the world of tax, it's quite interesting. They're using it to interact with the users of H&R Block's tax preparation software. Uh, problem and answer, uh, question and answer system. You pose it a question, it helps provide an answer. Also using it in the insurance industry. In Japan, an insurance company has adopted it. Uh, for Coco Mutual Life Insurance Company, it's called. They've adopted it to help calculate uh, whether or not to make an insurance uh, premium payout. In the world of architecture, Gramazia and Koller, a Dutch firm, used a swarm of autonomous flying robots to build this structure out of 1,500 bricks. We Build Homes, another Dutch firm, webuildhomes.nl. Uh, it's a website where architects go online and out of digital Lego blocks build buildings, and then people who are looking for a home sift through the buildings, uh, choose one they like, and it gets delivered to them and assembled. Uh, the, new concert the, uh, the new concert hall in Hamburg, uh, it was designed algorithmically, not using traditional designers or architects. It's, it's a really beautiful building. It has 10,000 interlocking panels. And what the system did was you set it a set of design criteria, things like ma the material you wanted it to be made of, the acoustic properties you wanted it to have, even some aesthetic things like if there was a panel within reach of someone's seat, it had to have a particular texture. And you set it these design criteria, and the system generated a spectrum of possible designs for the concert hall, and then somebody just had to choose between them and choose the one that they liked. And I said, and there were a couple of laughs, that we looked at divinity in the book, and I think, my, I think the most playful, but one of the most troubling examples comes from the world of divinity, and it's this. In 2011, the Catholic Church issued the first ever digital imprimatur. And an imprimatur is the official license granted by the Catholic Church to religious texts. It granted it to this app called Confession that helps you prepare for confession. So it's got tools for tracking sin, and it's, it's got various drop-down panels of options for contrition. Um, so that's, that's a flavor of the sort of thing that we were trying to make sense of in the book. And, and as I said, and as you, as you can see, it's, these changes are underpinned by technological changes. And I'm going to hand back now to my dad to, to take you through those. Thank you very much, Daniel. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me join Daniel in saying what a, an honor it is to be speaking to you. I want to talk about technology and take you back, first of all, to 1996 when I wrote a book called The Future of Law. And this will sound unremarkable in retrospect, but one of the main predictions I was making at the time was that the dominant way that lawyers and clients would come to communicate in the future would be by email. I kid you not, the, the Law Society of England and Wales responded by saying that I should not be allowed to speak in public. <laughs> they said I was bringing the legal profession into disrepute by suggesting email would be used between lawyers and clients. And I say this today because a number of the technologies we'll be talking about or I'll be referring to over the next few minutes, you'll think, well, it's unlikely they'll apply in law it's, or in other professions. I can't see artificial intelligence applying in medicine or auditor tax, but actually everything we say is way more likely today than email was in 96. Just to try and grasp what's going on in the world of technology very briefly, 
we look at it under four headings. The underpinning technologies, whether it be processing power or data storage capacity or bandwidth, they're all growing at an exponential and explosive rate. No one in Silicon Valley is dusting their hands off and saying, job done, we can stop now. The imperative to move forward at increasing rates is quite remarkable. So we're seeing all these underpinning technologies growing explosively. And this is giving rise to what Daniel hinted is a key term in our book, that our machines are becoming increasingly capable. They're able to take on more and more tasks. More and more tasks that we used to think required human intelligence are being taken on by machines. The solving of problems, the analysis of huge amounts of data, even the detection and expression of human emotions, and of course robotics as well. Our machines are doing more and more. They're also becoming increasingly pervasive, not just in our handhelds and our tablets, but certainly there, but also through what's known as the Internet of Things, that we have chips embodied in everyday objects and soon in human beings as well. And finally, as human beings, we're becoming increasingly connected in new ways. Most of you will be familiar with Skype, but now we're seeing telepresence, like Skype and steroids, wonderfully powerful ways of communicating with people online. And, uh, and again, social networks uh, affecting not just uh, the 1.8 billion people who use Facebook, for example, but we've seen in the professions, say 600,000 doctors in 30 countries on one so single social network. So the technologies are moving ahead at a remarkable rate, and none perhaps more so than artificial intelligence. And for me, this is uh, a nostalgic issue, because in the 80s in Oxford, uh, I was heavily involved with the development of the early systems in AI and law. And I want to essentially give, by way of a case study of what's happening in the professions, talk to you about what's happened in AI and law. And it's happened in two waves. The first wave for me, uh, began, uh, this is my doctorate in, in Oxford, uh, I was interested in legal philosophy, and uh, my work then, I suppose now, was really addressing one question, can computers solve legal problems? I've always thought that's an interesting theoretical and practical question. And I finished my doctorate, but not long after that, one of my examiners, a former dean uh, of the law school in Oxford, uh, asked me if I would be interested in working in a project with him. And the foundations, or the premise of the project, was this extract from a piece of legislation. Section two of this act shall not apply to an action to which this section applies. <laughs> now someone somewhere presumably thought that was okay as a piece of drafting. But this, is a, this was an extract from the Latent Damage Act 1986, a piece of legislation that fundamentally changed the law of limitation. The law of limitation governing when you can no longer raise an action because too much time has elapsed. It's called being time barred. And this new piece of legislation came into force in 86. No one understood it because it was drafted like this. My friend Philip Capper, who was the, the, the dean in Oxford, he said he'd written a book on the subject, but still no one practically could understand when it is for cases involving the professions, cases involving the manufacturing industry, the construction industry, the produ uh, uh, production industries too, no one really understood the applicability in practice of this act. So he said, why don't we develop an AI system, a system that could solve problems like he did? Now in this era, in the 80s, it was the field of a branch called AI called expert systems that was flourishing. An expert system was a system, basically what one did was you sit down with a human expert, you transfer the knowledge and expertise from their head, and you make that expertise available to others. And we developed the system, I sat down, I was what's called the knowledge engineer. I sat down with Philip and for nine months I mined the jewels from his head and we developed a system. This was the front screen and I put it up today. I just want you to know that at the time this was state of the art graphics. It, <laughs> and it's now rather shameful. But that, uh, we were very happy with the two people shaking hands up at the top right. That was the, one of the highlights of the project. We, we delivered the system. Ladies and gentlemen, this was in the days where floppy disks, floppy disks genuinely were floppy. This is a five and a quarter inch floppy disk. One barrister who tried out the system complained to us that he had broken his CD player. He put it in the wrong system. But this, <laughs> this was in the days of floppy disks. But essentially we had developed a decision tree. In fact, it was a huge decision tree. Over two million paths through the system. A representation of Philip's expertise. And a representation through which less expert people could wander and solve problems in this difficult area of law. And in the end, I think the best tribute we can play to the system is this, that Philip to this day will say that the system in the end was better than him. I outperformed him. Philip always says, it never had Friday afternoons. It was consistent, every time the same. And 
we thought at this stage, well, within a few years, these will be commonplace across the world. And to a large extent, this hasn't happened yet. It will happen. But what was quite interesting, I think, in retrospect, and we weren't alone because we were, there were people working in medicine and tax and audit and consulting in similar such systems. We all had great hopes that by the 90s, these systems would be pervasive. But actually, in the end, they were costly to develop. But more importantly, in the world of the professions, there was little incentive for professionals to develop them. Remember at this stage, this is a time where, by and large, most professionals charge by the hour. Now, our system reduced research time from about 10 hours to 10 minutes. If you're charging by the hour, why would you want to do that if your competitors aren't doing it? The commercial incentives weren't there. But actually, above all else, in our explanation in some ways for what was known as the AI winter, where AI seemed to disappear from the... From the commercial world certainly, to some extent from the academic world, what actually happened was in the early 90s, the web was invented. And most of us working on technology in the profession suddenly found a more intuitive, easier, more useful way of making content, materials, advice, guidance available online. So most of us moved from AI to the web. But then a very remarkable thing happened in 1997. A man called Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion, was beaten by a computer system called Deep Blue. Now, in the 80s, when we talked about this, we thought this would never be possible. And the reason we thought it wouldn't be possible, I think, is extremely relevant. And it relates to what Daniel was saying earlier. The conception in the 80s of building a system that could perform at the level of an expert or higher was that what you'd do is you'd sit down with an expert, essentially identify the rules that they follow in being experts, and replicate them in a computer system. The real intelligence, actually, was in the model you developed to put in the system. But here was the problem. You speak to a great chess player or a great doctor, and you ask them how it is they come to their decision in a difficult case or a difficult situation, they'll say, I don't know. There seems to be some, what people were calling and still call tacit knowledge, some ineffable realm of knowledge and expertise that underpins expert performance that we can't articulate in the body of rules. So the happy conclusion many people came to in the 80s, which I suspect many of you in the room will share today, was that, well, computers are good, as Daniel was saying, at doing the rule-based stuff, you take the routine work of professionals and put it in the computer system. But when it gets tough, when the going gets tough and you need real difficult problems sorted by the, by the best, that requires the magic of human intelligence. That's what we thought, but we were wrong. Remember when Kasparov was beaten. He was not beaten by a computer system in the end that was intelligent or genius. He was beaten by a computer system that could process 330 million moves a second could look at these possible moves. Good chess player with a falling wind can only look at about 100 moves uh, at one go today. We had underestimated the exponential increase in the power of, in processing power of computers. So Kasparov was beaten by brute processing power, lots of data, clever algorithms. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what threatens to take on a lot of professional work in the future. But what's very interesting in all of this, and it was so well put by uh, Patrick Winston at MIT, who said to us when we're writing the book, there are lots of ways of being smart that aren't smart like us. And this gives rise to something that Dan and I call the AI fallacy. And that's the mistaken assumption that the only way to develop systems that perform tasks at the level of experts or higher is to replicate the thinking processes of human specialists. It's a remarkably human-centric view of things. That if you get a computer system, the only way it can replace an expert is by doing it, the work as we do it. But why would you not be using the unique features of technology, the processing power, the data processing capacity? And that's what's happening. Computers are outperforming us now, but working entirely different ways. But you don't understand, so many professionals will say to me, Richard, the reason my clients come to me, my patients come to me, is because of my judgment. How can a computer system ever exercise judgment? And we say that's the wrong question. Here's one better question. To what problem is judgment the solution? Or to put it another way, why is it that people go to human professionals at all? What's the problem they have for which human judgment is our tool to solve? How do we solve these problems? That people come to us, we exercise our judgment. In your experience, in your judgment, we'll be asked as experts, how do you advise us to proceed? And why do people ask these questions? What's the problem? It's a problem of uncertainty. Facts are uncertain. Knowledge is uncertain. They ask for our experience. They ask for our judgment as experts to cope with the uncertainty. So in a way, the better question is, can computers handle uncertainty? Not can computers exercise judgment. 
Judgment is our way of handling uncertainty. Computers handle uncertainty in different ways. For example, they handle it by huge amounts of data. Great work going on in the prediction of judicial decisions by computer systems. There's one system that apparently can outperform human lawyers in predicting the decisions of patent courts. It knows nothing about patent law. It's 100,000 past patent cases. The name of the judge, the name of the court, the name of the lawyer, the name of the law firm, the name of the party, the value of the, the claim, the nature of the claim, the time of day of the claim, the length, and so forth. Partly, if you have all these variables, and there's 100,000 held, you can make a more accurate statistical prediction of the courts than most lawyers. Ah, but most lawyers will say to me, it's not really answering a legal question there. It's not really offering legal advice. But take a step back. What is the question that every client asks when they've got a dispute coming over the horizon? What's our chances of winning? Remember Abraham Maslow once said, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Where if you're a lawyer, everything looks like a legal problem. But that client's not necessarily asking a legal question. They're wanting an indication of the likelihood of winning or losing. And if systems, it turns out, can offer a more accurate prediction, and that's well researched and well shown, we believe human beings, human clients will go for this. And similarly in medicine, if statistical predictions based on massive amounts of past data, if statistical predictions are outperforming human diagnostics, then people will default to the statistical predictions. We saw this in dermatology in the diagnosis of melanoma, the paper in Nature recently. These systems are outperforming the finest dermatologists. But can machines think? We all want an answer to that question. We love this question. We're both trained in philosophy. But it's actually a red herring in this case. Consider again IBM's Watson, Daniel mentioned, a system that appeared in a TV quiz show and beat the two best ever human champions. Jeopardy, that TV quiz show. We don't have it in the UK. But the next day, and this is a wonderful quotation, we think, from John Searle, the philosopher, who wrote... <laughs> Watson doesn't know it won in Jeopardy. This is so vital. Watson didn't phone up its mum to say how it felt. <laughs> it didn't want to go to the pub to celebrate. Watson didn't want to do anything. It's a non-thinking machine, but outperforming us. And Daniel Melson and AlphaGo as well, the system that won or beat four games to one, the World Go champion. I want you to think about one moment in that game, the second of five games, in fact, in the 37th move. You can see it on YouTube. The commentators thought the move by the machine was a mistake. The world champion, or a world champion, later described the move as beautiful. No human being had ever thought of that move. Now, in human beings, we'd call that creative, we'd call it imaginative, we might call it genius. These are the wrong terms to apply to a machine. But it's very clear that this machine that was trained in two ways. One, it was given a whole bundle of past matches so it could appreciate good play. And then, in the clever bit, the machine was allowed to play itself many hundreds of thousands of times and got better and better in doing this. It's a system, interestingly, at the end that outperforms human beings and no one can really explain why it made that move. But what's very interesting is redefine the tactics and the strategy in that game. That's from a machine developed by human beings. Rid yourselves of the conception of technology. The machines can only do that which was within the contemplation of the programmers. We're way beyond that. These machines, in this instance, are Playing, and le playing themselves, learning from their own experience. And scary, in fact, they are producing outcomes that we as human beings, even the designers, can't fully understand. We are, ladies and gentlemen, therefore, in the era of increasingly capable, non-thinking machines. They're outperforming many professionals already, and that is the second wave of AI. Now, I want to hand back to Daniel to discuss the, what this means, or what the implications of this are for work. One of, the, one of the things we do when we think about the future of work is that we tend to talk about the different jobs that people do. And we've both done it already today. We've talked about lawyers and doctors and teachers, accountants and so on. And actually the term jobs is very unhelpful. And it's unhelpful because it encourages us to think of the work that professionals do as monolithic, indivisible lumps of stuff. When actually... And of course, intuitively, it makes complete sense. Professionals perform a wide range of different tasks and activities in, in their work. Um, why does this matter for thinking about the future of work? When we published a, the book uh, 18, 18 months ago, the, the economists reviewed it. Uh, and it, it was a good review, otherwise I, I wouldn't have mentioned it. Um, 
But alongside the review was this great cartoon of Professor Dr. Robot QC. And there's a sense when we think about the future of work and we think about the future of the professions in terms of jobs, that the only way technology affects work is that one day a professional will wake up and find a robot sitting in their chair. Their job will have been entirely displaced by a robot. And clearly, that isn't how technological change affects the work that people do. What it does is it changes the tasks and activities that people do in their work. So what does this mean for, for, thinking, about, for thinking about work? I on, on the screen here, we, we, we both tend to say that when people think about machine capability, they, they tend to have what we call a Rubik's Cube conception of machine capability. And on the screen here is a, a man who, out of Lego and his smartphone, built a system that could solve a Rubik's Cube in, in just a few seconds, uh, far faster than leading human Rubik's Cube experts. Now, I think many people in the room uh, will be impressed by this, uh, but ultimately not that surprised. Yes, it's very impressive, it's a complicated thing to solve a Rubik's Cube, it's very difficult to do, but ultimately it's rules-based, it's logical, it's, uh, uh, it's self-contained. Again, it's what we might call a routine task. Uh, and professionals will say, you know, we perform things that require creativity, judgment, empathy, we perform non-routine tasks. So in the context of what, what we've said so far, I think there's two important things to have in mind in thinking about the future of professional work. The first is this that when we move from thinking about jobs to thinking about tasks and you take professional work, a lump of professional work, and break it down into its, all its constituent tasks and activities, it transpires that actually quite a lot of the work that professionals do is routine rather than non-routine. You know, not everything that professionals do, and in some cases not that much, requires the sort of creativity, judgment, and empathy that certain parts of professional work do require. So that's the first thing. The second point is rela relates to this idea of the AI fallacy. When we look at those residual non-routine tasks, the sorts of things that traditionally we might have thought human beings were uniquely placed to do, it's also a mistake to think that these systems and machines, when performing those tasks very differently to human beings, can't also perform some of those tasks and activities too. You know, this is what Google, uh, Google are doing with DeepMind. The system uh, isn't trying to replicate the sort of judgment of a human being, and sort of reasoning of a human being, it's performing the task in a different way. The system that designed that concert hall in Hamburg, it wasn't trying to replicate or copy the creativity of a human architect, it was doing it in a very different way. Uh, this is me and my dad with Paro, a therapeutic seal, uh, which is a seal that offers, uh, uh, offers support and help and makes uh, kind noises towards, uh, towards uh, people who hold it. Uh, it's being used, in some cases, as an alternative uh, to various types of uh, medication. In other cases, it's being used um, just for general comfort and support. But there's no sense in which this therapeutic seal is offering the sort of empathy that a human being might offer, that it's solving the problem uh, in a different way. In, in the world of uh, technology and work and thinking about the future of work, there's a particular number which often gets reported in the press, and, and it's 47%. It's... Uh, it's a number that came out of research done by some of my colleagues at Oxford, uh, Michael Osborne and Carl Frey, and, and they estimated that 47% uh, of work that is currently done in the U.S., so not just the professions across the U.S. workforce, within the next decade can be automated. And, you know, it's a huge number, and, and this is why that number has attracted such attention. But what they're really saying with this 47% is that when you break down professional work or any type of work as it is today, 47% of the tasks that people currently do today in their work uh, can be automated uh, in the next decade. That's what they're saying. So, of course, the big gap in what they're saying is that we'll see not only professionals concentrating or all types of workers concentrating in narrower types of tasks, but there'll also be more demand for those tasks. And, and, and this, again, is intuitive. Think about a doctor. A doctor equipped with a diagnostic system might spend less time perhaps doing in-person medical checkups but she may spend more time reading the latest medical research. Uh, an auditor, freed from doing tax compliance work, forced to doing, uh, driven into doing tax planning work, might instead do more tax planning work. So that's, that's the problem with those, those headline numbers. They're very static. They assume that the tasks and activities that people do in their work doesn't change over time. The challenge that we raise in our book is that actually, even for those residual types of tasks, what we're seeing is over time then being taken away by technology too. And 
And in thinking about the future of work, I and this is what I look at in my research at the moment, understanding this new race that's taking place, on the one hand, between people being pushed into a narrower and narrower set of types and tasks in which human beings retain the comparative advantage, uh, but on the other hand, demand increasing for those residual tasks. Uh, understanding whether or not those, uh, those effects offset each other, I think, is, uh, is, um, is, is the problem that we have to try and address. Let me just finish very briefly in, in the last couple of minutes with just two of the implications that we, we think this raises. The first is, who should own and control tomorrow's practical expertise, these bodies of knowledge, expertise, wisdom, know-how, this ability to solve these difficult problems? Traditionally, it's been the professions. Um, and the, we can think of the tr professions as uh, old gatekeepers, traditional gatekeepers. One way of thinking about the work that we've done is that it's a story about the decline of these traditional gatekeepers, but we might, in response, worry about the rise of new gatekeepers, new organizations, new institutions, new types of people solving the sorts of problems that traditionally the professions alone have solved, but perhaps aren't... Uh, aren't constrained by the sorts of norms and values that the traditional professions might have been constrained by. Let me just give you one example. A few years ago, the IRS began a process of tax simplification. Uh, in response, TurboTax uh, fought against it, TurboTax being one of these new institutions. Uh, Intuit, the company that owns TurboTax, spent $11.5 million on federal lobbying in, in the five years leading up to that. And, and their, their response to it was that, you know, like many other companies, Insure actively participates in the political process. Um, but I think it's a legitimate concern that we might see the rise of new types of gatekeepers, new types of institutions taking ownership of these bodies of, of practical expertise. It's interesting here, by the way, that this work, this investigative work on, on TurboTax was led by ProPublica, which is a very different type of journalistic enterprise than a traditional uh, uh, newspaper. Finally, and, and the last question, everything we've spoken about today is, uh, is about what machines can do, uh, what they could do. There's then a, a broader set of questions about are there some tasks and activities that even if we could automate, we probably ought not to, uh, that there ought perhaps to be some moral limitations on these machines. Now, in, in the legal world, for example, uh, increasingly parole decisions in certain parts of the US are being made algorithmically. And we might feel comfortable with that, but do we feel comfortable with systems and machines making life sentencing decisions? Uh, perhaps not. Similarly, in the medical setting, these diagnostic systems are very impressive, and we might uh, encourage the use of them in, in doctor's surgeries. But how do we feel about systems in hospitals making decisions to turn off life support machines, even if uh, they could make those decisions more effectively and more efficiently than a team of doctors responsible for a particular ward. So I think there are normative questions throughout about what the moral limits of these machines might be and, and where we might want to keep humans in the loop that we need to investigate. There's a precedent for it, at least in, in the UK, uh, in the Warnock inquiry. Uh, Dame Warnock, uh, Mary Warnock, a philosopher, led an inquiry in the 1980s just as the technology behind IVF and, and test tube babies was was uh, taking off, trying to tease out the moral challenges and the moral difficulties around, around these new technologies that are all emerging. And we think across the professions, there's lots of instances where this sort of study and reflection uh, would, be, would be very important. So we will finish there. Thank you very much again, and we look forward to hearing some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Richard and Daniel, for stretching us all. Um, and I'm sure there are questions from the audience. So I see a hand over there. Uh, Is this going? Yeah, yeah. My name is Tom Whittington, uh, a lawyer who uh, would, would love to have your system do all of my work. Uh, <laughs> but my question is really uh, perhaps deeper than that. Uh, when do you see Skynet taking over? And if you see that happening, should we be thinking of electing Arnold Schwarzenegger as president of the United States. I mean, I, so, do we want to take a group of questions and respond or one Okay, question? why don't we take three yeah. questions. Um, any up there? 
Yeah. Yes, uh, Larry Einhorn, Indiana. I'm not going to ask if machines should replace speakers here at the APS, uh, but I'm going to ask about two professions, uh, uh, physicians and uh, police detectives. So an advantage of a machine is that their thought process is not constrained by doubt. But what about intuition? Okay, one more question over there. Yep. Um, I understand, yeah. in, I think, pretty clearly. In the last uh, comments, uh, you were focusing on the uh, uncertainty of value uh, depending on uh, how the situation and the people uh, work together. Uh, and I think it's a very important point because if you look at the way companies work now and they have access to good machines, what they will try to do is design the problem so that in fact uh, it is uh, appropriate to be able to use a huge volume of information, but limited within a range of possibility. I can give you a simple example where that can't happen. Uh, there were a bunch of doctors who were looking at photographs of a lung of a patient. And the lung was a problem, but they couldn't find anything wrong with it. My brother, who was also a physician, uh, an expert on lungs, took a look at it and he said, this person breathed a diamond, uh, I'm sorry, breathed a dime, and there it is on edge, and I can see it in the picture. Well, there was no way you could have calculated in advance, I'm going to build a machine that looks at pictures of lungs searching for a dime on edge. Uh, but the value of actually solving that problem is enormous. So. I think it's terribly important in this research to try to think about uh, the domains in which the possibility of conclusions coming out that would not be uh, accessible within an arbitrarily big system of facts, but which might be hugely valued. And therefore, if we could give more emphasis to the value to originality uh, than, uh, than value of a pure efficiency, maybe we'd get better progress and more utility for really good uh, 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 person, imaginative human being. Thanks. We promised one more brief question, and then we'll hear from the two Siskins. Yeah. I understand how um, in areas where you know the question and have a lot of data and you use that data to answer the question, how AI could be of great importance, but what about the areas like science, history, right, uh, novelists and so forth, where the issue is what is the right question to ask, right? How long before, um, we can have AI that will do that. Mm. Thank you. Uh, could, I, could I add a couple? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, the question about intuition was an interesting one, uh, and police were mentioned there. And again, I think the way we tackle this in terms of method is not to think, how can a computer exercise or exhibit or replicate intuition? It's to think, what problem is uh, intuition by human beings try to solve? And let me give you a couple of examples in the era of effective computing. Machines can both detect and express human emotions. There are machines now more accurately than any human being can look at a human smile and tell whether or not that smile is fake or genuine. There are machines more accurately than any human being can listen to two female voices and tell whether or not they belong to a mother and a daughter. And this is all based on data and what it what we're seeing in the world of machine learning is you ha if you have sufficiently large sets of data, then in the instance, for example, of the, the police detective who will be relying on intuition as the human tool for assessing, for example, questions of credibility, machines in terms of facial expressions use a different set of techniques, but more accurately to establish credibility. It's a fascinating threat to, or has implications for, the jury system, where increasingly judges will say to me when I talk about technology, but you, you need, in most criminal cases, someone to settle the questions of fact, and that requires people assembling together in a physical courtroom to look them uh, in the face. Well, it, it'll be, it's fairly clear already that systems are 
better in some areas at identifying the truth or falsehood of statements by uh, participants in a trial. So that was one thing. Do you want to, should we alternate in response? Mm. I thought the, the, the question about when systems and machines will be able to identify interesting questions uh, is, an, is an interesting thought. The, the system developed by IBM, Watson, the, the, the system, they've, um, in the medical setting, they, they've used the system to underpin a technology called NIT, Knowledge Integration Toolkit, I think it's called. Uh, and they use that system to scan, uh, scan the medical literature on a particular protein called P53. I think it's P53. And it's a particular protein that, that uh, if it's turned on, uh, can be used to uh, tackle various types of cancer. And the question is, which enzymes should we be trying to, how do we find enzymes that turn on this protein and get it working? Uh, there is a literature on this, and what this technology did was it scanned this literature and generated a set of new hypotheses, new alternative enzymes that might be worth further investigation. So the sort of, um, the sort of thing that you're describing, I think, is recognized as, as an interesting and fruitful area for, for these systems to, to be used in. Uh, the, the question about Skynet was, uh, was a playful, but also uh, I, th I think there's, there's something quite important there, which is that... In, in the field of artificial intelligence, there is a lot of excitement and a lot of hype uh, and questions about machines taking over and questions about Skynet and, uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think they're fun and interesting, but I also think that they distract us from what's actually happening in, in the professions, what's happening actually happening in the professions, which is technologies that are far less exciting and far less dramatic than things like Skynet. Uh, and technologies which, if we use them, we could, could make quite a big difference to improving people's access to the sorts of expertise that traditionally they haven't had access to. Uh, in, in, if you walk through British courts, you'll still see fax machines around the place. Uh, and you know, the, where, where we are in practice versus where we might be in the future, it's such a big gap that I think focusing on those sort of long, long run worries and excitements is, is an unhelpful distraction from what we can use technologies that exist today uh, to do. Just, r just keep in mind this idea that the traditional professions are creaking. Not enough people have access to, in our view, the sorts of expertise that's traditionally been in, uh, kept in the heads of professionals. And to the extent we can use technology to, to, to solve those problems differently, I think that's... It, it's that's absolutely right. I mean, if you look at our health services in the UK and the US, if you look at our legal services, access to justice, if you look at our educational services, no one is saying they're affordable and outstanding. We're all worried. So it's not that we're seeing these technologies are coming into play in a situation where the systems are performing rather well. Our systems, as we keep on saying, are creaking. Let me respond to the lung diagnosis observation, because I think that, to some extent, if I may, betrayed the view that you would have to develop a system where the programmer was contemplating uh, that someone had ingested uh, a, a dime. But in fact, what what these systems do and do very well in image processing and pattern recognition is anomaly recognition. It wouldn't be necessary for the system to identify the nature of the object but probably more accurately than any human beings now, the experience we're seeing, I think, from the work in Moorfields Hospital in London in image processing in relation to uh, ophthalmic problems is that these systems uh, can scan, analyze, compare, contrast, and identify anomalies amongst uh, all manner of scans and images. And so I think the mistake, again, is to think we, ha we would have to program a machine to anticipate all eventualities. That's the first wave of AI where you've got the big decision tree. The second wave of AI is you use massive amounts of past experience and partial or complete pattern matching of current data against past data produces some kind of analysis. Now my inner Annie Westcott has uh, <laughs> informed me to keep my eye on the clock, but I did promise myself uh, one question. Um, and I want to ask it uh, in different ways for each of you. You've learned a little bit about the American Philosophical Society today, um, founded in 1743, just uh, 80 years um, after the Royal Society. You've written a book about the future, so I would like each of you to tell me what you think meetings of the American Philosophical Society will be, if it exists, <laughs> and who or what will attend it, in, uh, in your case, Richard, 50 years from now, in Daniel's, in your case, 100 years from now. 
people, um, one of the most common reactions to our book is people think that these ideas apply to every profession other than their own. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and so there's the, the tendency to think, well, actually, I can't imagine replacing this kind of stuff. As it ha people often say, well, you're, you're a speaker. Would it have been good if, uh, uh, if we presented electronically? Answer probably wouldn't have been as good, but probably would have been, as, uh, probably been uh, better than nothing. But which leads me to think that I, I still think um, that human beings will want to congregate together. I think we'll enjoy one another's company. I think that the biggest shadow hanging over my view of 50 years from now, because uh, this takes us to a time, if you follow um, Moore's law, this idea that processing power is doubling every two years or so, and most material scientists, computer scientists say this is going for many years yet. By 2050, which is only uh, 33 years hence, the average desktop machine will have more processing power than all of humanity put together. That's only in 33 years' time. 17 years beyond that, the processing power of our machines will be astounding. I think uh, artificial intelligence, not just the narrow forms of AI we're talking about today, where computers can help with very narrow, well-bounded problems, but artificial general intelligence, I think that'll be very much in play. So it's very hard to imagine what our world would be like. And it leads me to think, and it's something I, I, I see very tentatively, but it, it's of current interest to me. And this is, uh, most people want to establish this division between human beings on the one hand and machines on the other going forward and what's the relative responsibility of each. But if you look at the advances that are making made in robotics and prosthetics and also some of the work that's been done on uh, essentially in one way or another enhancing human performance, uh, there is an argument that the next generation of human beings will be digitally enhanced. So what I would say is when we get together 50 years time, we'll be we won't be raw flesh and blood. Uh, you will look askance at something, are you not digitally enhanced? I'm very quaint. Uh, <laughs> there'll be an expectation. I, I think the technology and the people uh, and human beings will to some extent actually have, uh, have come together. Yeah. April 2117. Yeah. <laughs> For I, the record. Yeah. I just ask, ask, ask myself the question, do, you know, e even though computers are now wildly better than human beings, uh, uh, an individual human being acting alone at chess, uh, do human beings still enjoy playing chess with each other? And I, I think the answer to that is clearly yes. Uh, uh, you know, we, we value uh, these activities that, the, uh, that human beings do, partly because they produce some output which might be a good output, but also we value them as, as we were talking this morning because it's the, the product of human beings. Uh, the, the value comes not only from the outcome, but from how the outcome is produced, how it's performed. And, and uh, I, I imagine that that is something that will be with us indefinitely, however capable these systems and machines come. You know, will we still enjoy playing Go in 100 years' time? Of course we will, even though systems and machines will be vastly more effective. So I imagine we will yeah, very much still enjoy uh, coming and congregating and sharing ideas. Great, and maybe you'll come in 2170. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please, is the, um, yeah, I, I think maybe uh, Daniel and, R and Richard can stay here for a few minutes to take questions, but I know that there's a council meeting in 20 minutes, and um, if not my inner Annie Westcott, then my inner Clyde Barker says I better be quiet. <laughs> well, just... <laughs>